Hi everyone, thanks for joining me. Today we talk about concurrency in Crystal. I'll try to give you an introduction covering communicating sequential processes, the very basics of uh, Crystal's execution model, and then a few uh, quite tricky concepts for uh, people uh, looking into uh, writing concurrent applications for the first time. But let's start from uh, the very beginning. So Crystal implements uh, natively a um, concurrency paradigm called communicating sequential processes, in short CSP. And CSP is about having processes communicating with each other by passing messages over channels. In Crystal in particular, we don't talk about processes, we talk about fibers. And a fiber is a lightweight and cooperative uh, unit of execution. We'll see what that means in a second. And channels are a way to regulate data exchanges between fibers. We say that sometimes the channels are blocking on send and receive. And we can think of channels as uh, something similar to queues, even though the analogy sometimes breaks. If we want to think of it uh, as a, uh, in, in, in a sketch, we can imagine a scenario where you have an office where Alice uh, writes letters Bob puts the letters into envelopes and uh, the trusted postman Charles uh, ships uh, the envelopes. In this uh, example, Alice, Bob and Charles are fibers and uh, Alice's uh, letters are a type of message and the envelopes are a different type of message. So we have two different types of messages and in this analogy, the desks uh, act as uh, channels between the different fibers. So now that we have hopefully a fundamental understanding or grasp of what communicating sequential processes is about, we can look into some actual code. Because the support for CSP is native in Crystal, the code is simple enough that we can just dive straight uh, into it. Channel.new uh, will create a new instance of a channel. Uh, and in this case, we create a channel that can, um, that can um, be used to send and receive objects of type MSG. We can then initialize one of these MSG objects. You can imagine this might be a record or a class if defined somewhere else. And then what you can do what in what we call the main fiber, so the one that you write um, first in your program, is we can send a message to the channel. At this point, uh, you might be disappointed in uh, the output of the execution because the main uh, fiber will block at this point and the application will stall indefinitely. So there's something going on here that might not be 100% um, intuitive. So let's look into this a bit further. I mentioned that thinking about channels as queues is sometimes a bit misleading. I encourage you to think about channels the way you think about windows. In particular, in this uh, very nice drawing, we have a cook and a waiter and a chicken dish uh, in, uh, carried by the cook and a window between them. Now, you can think of the cook as the sending fiber, uh, our waiter is the receiving fiber, the window is the channel, and the chicken dish is the message. Now you can see how while the cook waits for the, uh, for the waiter to come and collect the dish, the cook cannot do anything else. This is because uh, the um, uh, window is uh, uh, thin enough uh, that you cannot put anything on the top of it and then move on and do your business. And this is what a channel um, really is about. It's just an interface between the two fibers, but it doesn't necessarily allow you to uh, store things into it. Now, going back to our fiber, uh, to, our, to our main fiber example, you can see how ch send a call from the fiber it is the same as having a cook uh, proposing a offering a dish of chicken uh, to the window but there's no waiter there uh, to come and collect that so it feels like we need to go take a step back and try and understand a bit better what crystal's execution model uh, looks like so there are three main concepts that we we need to have in our mind when talking about concurrency in crystal and the execution model one is the scheduler which is what uh, allocates time for fibers to run. It, they might it, the scheduler might be allocating time for for fibers to run on a single on a single processor processor or or maybe on a multi-core uh, architecture. It doesn't matter. 
An event loop is a fiber that coordinates a synchronous task, and a synchronous a task, for example, might be uh, our application making an HTTP call uh, to a remote, uh, a remote server. That's a good example of a, a task that is uh, performed in an asynchronous uh, fashion. So uh, while the fiber issuing the call waits for a response, something else can, uh, can go on in the application. Finally, uh, I'd like to stress the fact that the main uh, the main fiber uh, covers a, a prominent role in this uh, in this whole architecture. This is because, especially in particular, when we look at um, uh, applications running on a single core, uh, the termination of the main actually uh, coincides with the termination of the entire application, and this is something we should be uh, aware of. So we said that uh, sometimes um, in particular when, when calling ch send the main fiber blocks what is blocking about and how is that um, actually started well example examples of um, potentially blocking operation are uh, receiving or sending uh, to a channel making an http request calling sleep uh, in, a, in a in a fiber or calling fiber yield which is basically uh, the same as a fiber saying, "Hey, uh, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to take all the all the CPU for myself. Just yield the execution to a different uh, a different fiber." And this is where uh, we can. This is why we th we think about fibers as cooperative uh, units of execution because they can literally. There's there's some sort of awareness uh, in the, in the fiber of uh, not being the only one using resources and being keen on. Uh, blocking sometimes uh, so that other fibers can also can also run uh, concurrently to give you a pictorial representation of what goes on imagine there's a, a scheduler and a single thread we're running our fibers on and there's a queue of fibers that the scheduler knows um, need to be run the, the scheduler will just take the first the first fiber coming in fiber a and give fiber a a bit of uh, a bit of time to run in particular, we will spawn a fiber called fiber Z. Um, but what this will look like is we'll, the, 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 the runtime will generate the fiber, put it at the back of the queue. And at this point, we will call message equal dot uh, message equal uh, channel dot perceive. And this is where fiber A is actually blocking. Now, because fiber A is blocked on a receive call, uh, the scheduler will push the fiber back to the end of the queue and pull uh, the, the fiber at the head of the queue, which is fiber B. Now fiber B might have some more code and then call fiber.yield um, at some point. And yielding uh, is a way we mentioned to tell the scheduler that the fiber wants to go to the back of the queue. And so that's what's gonna happen. Fiber.yield is a blocking call and ske the scheduler will just push fiber B to the end of the queue and so on and so forth. Now, now that we know about blocking um, and uh, scheduler allocating uh, uh, CPU time to different fibers, let's try and fix our previous example so we can get to the end of the execution with something printed on, on the screen. We are still initializing our channel and our message as before, but this time we're also spawning a new processor fiber. And as we mentioned earlier, and, and uh, the, the, the spawning the fiber might not lead to the creation of the fiber straight away. The fiber might just be put at the end to the end of the of the queue. So we still go to the uh, end of our execution and call ch.send message. Now we mentioned that send is a blocking call. So what happens here is main will block on ch.send. The scheduler will send the main fiber to the back of the queue. And notice that there's a processor ready to be uh, run and give some execution time to the processor. Now the processor will call ch.receive and at this point um, uh, the uh, following will be printed on the screen, which is just a string representation of the message that was just received. Uh, the execution of the fiber is over, so the fiber will be uh, terminating and uh, the scheduler will uh, just get rid of the fiber and then look at the queue of fibers to be executed find main again at this point uh, main is not blocked on the channel uh, send anymore so main can terminate and our application is terminated and we printed what we expected 
So this all sounds good. Um, so we saw two variation of the same example, one that doesn't print, one that does print. In the first one, there was only one fiber, the main fiber, and in the second one, we have uh, two fibers, uh, the main fiber and a processor. Now we could or we could complicate this example even further, but that's not what we what we care about. Um, what we m should instead talk about is um, we should talk about capac the capacity of a channel. And this is because what we saw so far is we've initialized channels with capacity zero, we say, and when initializing uh, channels with capacity zero, every call, every send or, or receive call will be a blocking call. But there are ways of actually making these calls uh, non-blocking depending on the content of the of the channels to give ourselves a bit more um, uh, a, a bit more context let's look at an example where a fiber sends on a on a channel with capacity zero for example one of the channels we initialized in the previous examples so a fiber will show up send a message call send on on the channel and um, at this point just like the cook with the chicken dish in, in their hands, they will have to wait uh, for something to happen. So our fiber uh, calling send on the channel is blocked and waiting for something to come and pick up the chicken dish. And that's where another fiber will uh, pro possibly run. And whenever that fiber calls uh, c.receive, the message will be given to the fiber. And our initial sending fiber is able to now resume the execution. Let's look at the uh, an analogous case uh, on the other side. So if we have a um, channel with capacity zero and a fiber receiving on it, so we have a fiber calling receive on the channel, but nothing is available on the channel. So there's no chicken on the window at the, at the, at the moment. So we just have to wait. So the fiber calling receive will have to wait until someone shows up another fiber and sends the message to the, to the window. And now the sending fiber will also block the receiving fiber will be reading the message from the channel and then continue and at that point even the sending uh, even the sending uh, fiber will resume execution as well now let's look at a slightly more um, advanced example where the capacity of our channel is one rather than uh, rather than zero and as you say as you can see on the title it doesn't matter really what the capacity of the uh, of the channel is so long as it's more than one um, in case there's a spare capacity of one on the channel, whenever someone tries to, a fiber tries to send on the channel, the message will be stored in memory in the channel and the sending fiber will be able to continue the execution without, without blocking. So this is an example of a scenario where calling c.send is not a blocking call. On the other hand, receiving on a capacity, on a, on a channel with capacity more than zero when the remaining capacity of the of the channel is zero in this case but it could be uh, less than any less than the than the maximum capacity of the channel reading from the channel so receiving from the channel is actually a non-blocking operation too so calling c dot receive will just read the message and not and not block once again so just to recap fibers don't block when sending to a channel with spare capacity greater than zero and when receiving from a non-empty channel. So these are two scenarios to keep in mind where send and receive are non-blocking. So what do we do with this, uh, with this information? Well, let's go back to our two examples and try to, and try to swap the um, uh, channels with capacity zero with channels with capacity uh, greater than zero. So initializing with capacity greater than zero is as easy as passing the capacity a parameter and set it to whatever number you want and at this point ch is a what we call a buffered channel so a channel with some in-memory um, uh, buffer and if we run this example uh, you might remember from the previous execution this would not uh, this would stall and, and not complete not terminate in this particular case when we run this example the application actually does terminate after printing the message that has been sent through the through the ch channel which is somewhat surprising but if you think about it we said that ch send is not going to be blocking this time because the capacity uh, the spare capacity is one so the main fiber will just drop the message into the channel and then move on to the next statement where 
the channel the, the the message is read from the channel and then printed on the screen so two different uh, setups and very different outcomes for the two examples let's go and apply the same uh, strategy to the second example we saw so this time we initialize a channel with capacity 1024 again it doesn't really matter so long as the capacity is greater than one especially in these examples and this time if you remember the uh, output uh, of the uh, of the program was uh, the actual uh, printing of, uh, of of the message of the string representation of the message well if you run this with the channel with capacity greater than one what is actually going to happen is that you will see no output this is because we spawn a new fiber uh, but when we run when the runtime runs uh, ch.send uh, that's not a blocking call which means that our main gets to the end of the uh, execution and terminates the application before the scheduler can schedule the uh, processor fiber so if you think about it we saw uh, two different examples and then we tried to alter the capacity of the channel and that led to fairly um, uh, contrasting results if you wish right so if you want the expected behavior was uh, very much um, uh, upside down uh, depending on whether or not we set the capacity to something greater uh, than zero or not which leads me to close this presentation with a few considerations about the correctness of uh, concurrent applications in particular mind that the order in which uh, fibers run depends on the runtime implementation meaning that if the runtime implementation changes in particular if the implementation of channel channel changes from one version of crystal to the other then you're likely to see very different results than the one you expected the same applies to the architecture where you're running uh, your application on if you're running your application on multi-core uh, architecture and you enable the uh, multi-threading on uh, at the compiler level then you will see very very different results than uh, running the application with no uh, multi-threading enabled Another warning, try and not increase uh, the channel's capacity as a way out of bugs or better if you experience unexpected behaviors and you notice that uh, increasing the, the capacity of the channel actually makes the problem go, go away, uh, do not uh, think that you're actually fixing the bug, you're just hiding it uh, in a way where uh, the moment the, 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 the buffer will get full uh, you will still see the bug presenting itself. It's just going to be way harder to uh, debug it and, and assess it in the future. And in general, remember that uh, buffered channels, so channels with capacity greater than zero, can, yes, improve performance, but cannot fix the concurrency bugs. So don't use them as a mean of uh, fixing uh, issues, concurrency issues in your application. And finally, a few suggestions. For a start, Try and initialize all your channels uh, to zero capacity when writing your first uh, concurrent applications. The gist, well, the idea here is if your application works with zero capacity, then it should also work with capacity greater than zero. So the fact that the calls on uh, the blocking, the, the send and receive calls on the channel are blocking should not really change the outcome of your application. Uh, but if you cannot rely on knowing which order the applications the, the the fibers will be run by the scheduler what can you how can you assess correctness of a program well causality is still a thing so if a fiber a spawns fiber b so we say that a is the parent of uh, fiber b then all the code preceding the spawn uh, invocation will run before b of course so that's something you can rely on and again on causality if a sends a message to B to signal the fact that uh, it has completed a particular task then when B receives and handle the message uh, it can assume that A has uh, finished uh, taking care of the task the task um, above which is a way of saying uh, that rather than checking for the completion of something by asking um, a process uh, what's the state of the um, of the of, of the execution you should let the fibers tell each other when uh, when a task has been completed so so relying on a push model rather than a pull model in this context is the right thing to do and i'll leave you with a principle that you can 
uh, you, you can uh, use or, or think about when uh, when writing your first uh, concurrent application in Crystal, the order in which fibers run should not affect the correctness of your software. And again, order should not affect correctness. That's the gist of the story. I left a bunch of uh, references for you. Uh, you can go and check them out. Um, in particular, I, I recommend you give a go to uh, Concurrency in Go, which is a fantastic book about uh, concurrency uh, on, the, on the CSP um, paradigm. And if you can stand reading some, some Go code, then that's gonna be a fantastic way of getting you up to speed with um, a CSP in Crystal. I also left you with a few links to um, blog posts and um, uh, forum uh, uh, threads dis uh, and discussions about concurrency in Crystal so that you can, if you want, investigate this topic uh, further. So uh, thanks for watching and uh, see you soon with some more advanced material about concurrency.